The WWE this year specifically, the last year specifically, has been handing out a lot of first-time evers as it relates to matches or shows or feuds or storylines, whatever it is. And there's been one consistent tread or thread with the first time evers in the WWE. And we had these high expectations for them. And there's always something that ends up bringing it down a notch or two. Whether it be the countless amounts of dream matches that WWE has given away on free television, like the matches with Brian and Almas, or Hardy and Joe, or Styles and Nakamura, Styles and Joe, Nakamura and Styles. The match with Nakamura and Styles at WrestleMania was the first time ever, and that was probably one of the worst matches of the night, and I can't believe I'm even saying that. Shinsuke Nakamura received his first main roster title win in the form of the United States Championship, and they did absolutely nothing to keep Nakamura relevant and to keep that title relevant. The first ever all-women's pay-per-view in October, and had it not been for three matches, Tony Storm, Neo Shirai, Kyrie Sane, and Shannon Baszler, and that match of the year candidate with Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair, had it not been for those three matches, that show would have been a complete waste of time and a huge thumbs down on the WWE pay-per-view calendar. It was a decent show by the end of it, Based on those three matches, it was a decent show by the end of the night, but ultimately, there's been nothing historic, there's been nothing groundbreaking, there's been nothing special about a first time ever in the WWE. WWE has pretty much thrown them out there and killed the mystique of a first time ever. Then you take a look at NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool, and you wonder... What is the difference between this and what I just named? What is the difference between NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool and all the things I just named? Effort. Effort. Triple H has put so much time and effort into what he does and what he puts together. He puts so much time and effort into everything that he does with 205 Live, with NXT, with NXT UK, that they just feel special and they feel important. Vince McMahon is just throwing these things out there and he doesn't deem anything important other than the things that he finds interest in. And most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, the things that he finds interest in end up blowing up in his face. Roman Reigns. Take that, for example. Take the Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose feud. The way that Vince McMahon conducts business is so wrong on so many levels. The way that Vince McMahon conducts business is just so pathetic and pitiful. You take a look at how Triple H is doing things, and Triple H has put so much time and effort into everything that he does that he has made everything about his brands feel important and feel special, like they mean something. Every match on NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool felt important. Every single match felt like it meant something. It felt special. That is what effort gets you. Why is Monday Night Raw currently failing right now? Why have they had seven of their lowest rated episodes in the history of their entire of their entire brand? Of the entire Monday Night Raw brand? It's because they just put no effort. They put no effort into what they do. They just throw throw a few superstars out there with a few lines and a few storylines and feuds and expect to call it and call it a wrestling show. WWE is lazy. That is why all of these first time evers in the past have felt so flat. And by the end of it, it's just a shrug of the shoulders. NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool 
Flat is not a word to describe what I saw. What we saw was something that no one even expected coming. A lot of people have been overlooking NXT UK. A lot of people have been underestimating NXT UK. And that was because of what happened and how they're doing two episodes per week. And how everything has just felt rushed up until this point. Because Triple H tried to get a television deal in the UK for NXT UK and he couldn't do it. So he had to start the episodes late. And that's why he's doing all these all of these uh, episodes day by day by day by day. Two episodes uh, per week on a Wednesday. Back and forth and back and forth. And there you go. But NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool really kicked off the WWE pay-per-view calendar with a huge bang. And it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be very difficult for the for the Royal Rumble specifically to top this show. NXT uh, TakeOver Phoenix will probably have an easier time trying to top the show because it's NXT. And anything NXT is something special. But the Royal Rumble... It's going to be tough for any main roster pay-per-view to top NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool. Very hard. They They started the year off so well with the WWE pay-per-view calendar, that it's going to be difficult for any main roster pay-per-view to top the show. And we're going to go over that. For those of you who do not know who I am, I am DJ Storms, the one and only DJ Storms. Welcome back to the channel here on YouTube.com, as of course you already know who I am, Mr. Controversy, and the operator of the best damn Twitter handle known to mankind. This is the official rewind for NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool which took place two days ago on Saturday, January 12th. A couple of things. Um, I go back to college in two days, so it's going to be difficult for me to get a lot of content up for you guys. Um, I hope to continue to get as much content up as possible. And trust me, when the summertime comes around, brands getting kicked into high gear, you're going to see a lot, a lot of content coming your way. Trust me. Um, I'm also planning on doing another storm stream on Saturday. My guest is to be announced. I am in the process of finding a guest. I will let you know how that works out. The rundown for the Royal Rumble and TakeOver Phoenix, that's going to take place at the end of the month, obviously. February 17th, 2019 is the meetup for Wrestling Express at Pub 46 in Clifton, New Jersey. And I'm going to be there, Tommy McGrogan, Glenn Davidson, uh, all the members of Wrestling Express are going to be there. We are going to have fun. We're going to watch the Elimination Chamber. You can talk business with me. You can meet me. I may give you a free wristband. Uh, you can meet Tommy. Tommy's going to do a Facebook live stream. We're all going to be on uh, the live stream. You can watch me cut a promo. You can come hang out. It's always nice to meet new people. It's always nice to um, meet my fans. Come and hang out. It's free of charge. Pub 46 in Clifton, New Jersey, starting at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time on February 17, 2019. NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool. Wow. Wow. I was working all weekend, so I, I was really pissed that I wasn't able to watch the show live. But after what I saw... After what I saw, and I've actually watched it back a few times, I am I am like absolutely speechless. I'm really speechless uh, at uh what I really what I just witnessed. I can't. I'm like stuttering all over the place. I can't even form words properly. That's how good this show was. I, I don't I don't understand how how Vince McMahon. By the way, Vince McMahon said he apparently watched the show. He apparently watched the show because there was a chant. There was a chant by the UK crowd during the main event going, Are you watching? Are you watching, Vince McMahon? So, you know, apparently Vince McMahon said he watched it. And, you know, I'm shocked that Vince McMahon hasn't given Triple H the company now. But the show started off in poss probably the best way possible with a phenomenal tag team title match between the Grizzled Young Veterans, Zach Gibson and James Drake, and Mustache Mountain, Trent Seven and Tyler Bate. Tyler Bate, 
I I am you know I'm fully convinced you know I'm convinced that a lot of people in the WWE are not even human that they're cyborgs. You can add Tyler Bate to that category. I do. I, Tyler Bate should not be able to do 75 percent of the shit that he does. I am absolutely blown away by what Tyler Bate can do. I, I have a feeling that in the next few years, Tyler Bate is going to be on the main roster, and Tyler Bate is going to be in contention for at least Intercontinental Championship gold. That's how good Tyler Bate really is. He's He is way too talented to be restricted to just NXT UK. But this was a very good, um, slow-paced match to start off. Good storytelling. Trent Seven was actually um, bleeding. His cut wasn't that bad. The cut wasn't that bad, um, thankfully as well, because if he would have gotten a bad cut during that, it would have been a huge liability in the match. But his the back of his hair was all bloodied. It wasn't dripping. There was no blood on the on the mat, so it it wasn't too too much of a liability. Tyler Bate makes the tag, and Tyler Bate is just taking out everyone. He actually the guy does a double airplane spin. He put James Drake on Zach Gibson, and he picked up both men. And I, I do I don't know how Tyler Bate can do it. I I think I think at this rate we we should just start we we should we should just stop questioning Tyler Bate and just roll with it. I, I've been trying I've been trying to formulate how the hell this guy is able to do what he's doing, and I I just I can't give you guys a logical answer. I can't give you guys a logical answer, and you you know how I'm pretty much the overlord of logic. I, I, I can pretty much give you a logical explanation on everything wrestling related. I can't give you a logical explanation on Tyler Bate. I can't. Then we had Tyler Bate do an exploder suplex to James Drake off the apron, taking out Gibson, and did a apron running shooting star press, taking out both men. Then, fast forward... We had Trent Seven making the tag. Trent Seven's trying to take out both Gibson and Drake. Uh, Zach Gibson pushes Trent Seven in the corner. James Drake hits the grit your teeth drop kick. Zach Gibson with the helter skelter, and I do not know how he was able to pull off that helter skelter so well because Trent Seven is a big boy. Trent Seven's a big boy, so I don't know how he was able to pull off that helter skelter so well. And then after the helter skelter. James Drake pulls out a 450 splash. I have never seen James Drake do something like that in my life. James Drake, I have seen James Drake, and he's more of a ground-based brawler type guy. He's not a high flyer. That was the first time I've, I've ever seen James Drake do something like that. And if that was the first time he's ever done something like that, my God, he is a professional already. That was the first 450 I think he's done, and that was probably one of the best, if not the best looking 450 splash I'd ever, I, I've ever seen so far as a wrestling fan. Trent Seven kicked out. Everyone's going crazy. Everyone's fully behind Trent Seven. Tyler Bate makes the tag. Then we had a point where uh, Tyler Bate and Trent Seven hit that, that springboard clothesline dragon suplex combination. And James Drake kicked out. James Drake kicked out. Everyone's still going crazy. They were trying for that burning hammer move. But Zach Gibson had Tyler Bain in an electric chair position on the outside. Then, Trent Seven went for the Seven Stars Lariat on James Drake. James Drake flew through the ropes and did a modified doomsday device clothesline to Tyler Bate. Tyler Bate was knocked topsy-turvy off of Zach Gibson's shoulders, and I'm surprised he didn't, he didn't break something. He, I, I, I would, if he didn't land on his head, I would, I would have thought he would have torn his ACL from landing on his knees. That bump looked brutal. And then Trent Seven tried for a suicide dive. James Drake caught him with a kick right to the gut in midair. I, I don't understand how it was timed so perfectly. They throw him back in the ring, hit the ticket to mayhem, that tombstone pile driver, Throwing him into the code breaker. One, two, three, and the grizzled young veterans are your new and the first ever NXT UK tag team champions. I I was not shocked by this at all. I called Mustache Mountain, but I was not going to be mad if the Grizzled Young Veterans won, mainly because of the fact that 
in such a short amount of time, the Grizzled Young Veterans have become such a great heel tag team. And a lot of people don't really get this, but you do not know how much James Drake is really benefiting from this Zach Gibson heel team. James Drake, yeah, he was a decent wrestler. Yeah, he, he was he was talented. He was a decent heel. But ultimately, he was very overlooked, and he was ultimately a shrug of the shoulders type guy. You pair him with Zach Gibson, by the way, Zach Gibson is absolutely phenomenal at what he does. You pair him with Zach Gibson, and it's almost like James Drake has just boosted his relevancy level tenfold. Zach Gibson has single-handedly brought James Drake to prominent to prominence. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that something so simple like teaming a couple of guys up can make so much of a difference and they work so well together. And can you can you imagine can you imagine what it's going to be like when Mustache Mountain goes after the Grizzled Young Veterans at the next NXT UK takeover? Whenever that is, it is going to be a great moment when Mustache Mountain finally gets the titles. But pro probably the best way possible to kick off the show. Great match. And, you know, I, I don't have any complaints. It's hard, It's going to be very hard for me to find something bad about the show. Travis Banks versus Jordan Devlin was, was originally supposed to happen. But Jordan Devlin attacked Travis Banks, caused a knee injury. The match was still going to happen because Travis Banks was cleared. Travis Banks does a suicide dive as Jordan Devlin is making his way to the ring. He goes right after Jordan Devlin, but Jordan Devlin gets control, takes out Travis Banks. And Johnny Saint and Sid Scala said, we knew you, we knew, we knew you were going to try something like this, so we got ourselves a backup plan. Out comes Finn Balor. The place absolutely explodes. The UK crowd did not die down once. There was not one dull moment throughout the entire night. Every single moment, the UK crowd was on their feet. The UK crowd was screaming at the top of their lungs. The UK crowd's got a lot of energy. Got a lot of energy. WWE, please, do a WrestleMania in the UK. I don't even live in the UK. Do a WrestleMania in the UK, please. Finn Balor comes out, and, you know, it's funny because I saw one of, one of the people whom I follow... I think I saw I, I saw one of the people whom I follow, I can't remember who it was, but someone suggested that they want to see Finn Balor versus Jordan Devlin. I think WWE must have heard him, and here we go, Finn Balor versus Jordan Devlin. I don't really like the fact that you kind of shortchanged Travis Banks, because Travis Banks is very good at what he does. Travis Banks is a very good in-ring performer, and I think him and Jordan Devlin could have put on a very good match, but this was still a very good match. Jordan Devlin and Finn Balor. This was still a very good match. The chops that they were doing to one another, the chops that they were doing to one another, my God, my God, like within, within two chops, two chops later, their chests were beat red. They were really swinging hard. Both men were swinging for the fences here. Jordan Devlin, um, by the way, I love Jordan Devlin's Yurinagi moonsault combination. I absolutely love that combination. I think it's such a flush combination. Um, Jordan Devlin and Finn Balor, they were trading kicks. Uh, Finn Balor hit the Eye of the Hurricane that uh, Shane Helms used to do. Then he hit the inverted 1916. Jordan Devlin kicked out. Jordan Devlin went for a moonsault. By the way, Jordan Devlin's moonsault is beautiful. But Balor got the knees up. Balor hit the 1916 hit the corner drop kick, and then the coup de gras. Very good match. Very good match, first of all. Now, I'm a little mad that they shortchanged Travis Banks, and they kind of screwed over Jordan Devlin there, because Jordan Devlin's an up-and-coming star. And Jordan Devlin, you know, he he's really coming into his own as a great heel in NXT UK, so you would have thought that they would have given him the win. But Finn Balor got the win, and Finn Balor really proved that you know, he's not to be overlooked. This is the type of Finn Balor that we need to see on the main roster. For for whatever reason, I don't know why they are not putting Finn Balor in the same position that he's in in NXT. 
Look at where he was in NXT, and then look at what we got with NXT UK. That was probably the best Finn Balor looked in years. One night on NXT UK, and he looks better than he's done for the past number of years on Monday Night Raw. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? That tells you that the WWE main roster is doing something wrong. They have fucking ruined him. They absolutely ruined him on Monday Night Raw. One night in NXT UK, he's the hottest thing. He's one of the hottest things of the night. That's the magic that Triple H can work. Finn Balor defeats Jordan Devlin. Very good match. Very hard hitting as well. From that, we go to the no disqualifications match with Eddie Dennis and Dave Mastiff. I'm a fan of both Eddie Dennis and Dave Mastiff. Before, before the end of the night, I was actually under the impression that they were going to push Eddie Dennis towards the UK Championship, mainly because of the fact that Eddie Dennis has history with Pete Dunne. Dave Mastiff, you can add him to the list of cyborgs. Dave Mastiff is someone who doesn't really come around very often. And you take a look at Dave Mastiff, and you're thinking of a guy that's probably going to get gassed within five minutes. Dave Mastiff and Eddie Dennis, for the time that they were given, this match just went under 11 minutes. They absolutely tore each other apart, and they fit so much into this match. Within two minutes of this match, we had kendo sticks. And then we had the bottom of the steel steps get brought into the ring by Dave Mastiff. Dave Mastiff went for a high cross body. Eddie Dennis caught Dave Mastiff in midair. In midair. You take a look at Eddie Dennis, and he is not muscular at all. He's lean. He's like me. I'm, I'm lean. Eddie Dennis is like a taller version of me. He is a very lean individual. But, you know, appearances can be deceiving, can't they? Eddie Dennis picked up Dave Mastiff. This was the first of four times that Eddie Dennis picked up Dave Mastiff, and he did a spinning sidewalk slam, picture perfect, spinning sidewalk slam on the bottom half of the steel steps. I was not sure how Dave Mastiff was going to get up from that. Dave Mastiff kicked, uh, kicked out. There was a point in, uh, in the beginning of the match where Eddie Dennis tore up the, he tore up the, uh, the floor, tore up the padding on the floor, which is where the a uh, glass floor or the granite floor of the Empress Ballroom is. Later on in that match, Dave Mastiff did a rolling senton to Eddie Dennis on the floor. That must hurt. And then followed it up with a senton. So you had a two-for-one deal right there. Eddie Dennis. Before that, actually, Eddie Dennis was able to pick up Dave Mastiff as if he was going for the Severn Bridge, otherwise known as that razor's edge buckle bomb but he ended up pulling off just a regular razor's edge but the fact that he was able to hold eddie dennis up there and keep his shoulders attached to his body i mean that's just impressive in his own right how could you not appreciate eddie dennis how could you not be a fan of eddie dennis after that picture perfect razor's edge to a guy that's 300 pounds a guy that does not look muscular at all, was able to pick this guy up and hold him there for about 10 seconds. And then that, that wasn't even the craziest part. Dave Mastiff gets Eddie Dennis back in the ring. He does a double-sided springboard moonsault. Eddie Dennis moved out of the way, but it, 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 it was almost like Dave Mastiff is the... UK's version of Keith Lee. Does a double springboard moonsault out of the corner. And then Eddie Dennis followed it up. And he held him up again. This is the third time he picked up Dave Mastiff. Hit the next stop driver. Dave Mastiff kicked out. Later on in the match, Eddie Dennis was trying for the Severn Bridge through a table that he set up. Dave Mastiff reversed it into a high-angle German release suplex that Almost dropped Eddie Dennis on his neck. Then hit that jumping cannonball right through the table and he won the no disqualification match. I saw this match as almost an unofficial number one contenders match. Because after what happened in the main event, you know Pete Dunne's going to need another challenger 
before the next NXT UK TakeOver. So, somewhere down the line, maybe next month, I'm assuming, and I'm under the impression that we could very well see Dave Mastiff versus Pete Dunne for the UK Championship down the line. I mean, I, I don't understand why, why you wouldn't put Pete Dunne in there with Dave Mastiff. Dave Mastiff has been undefeated. There's only one place for Dave Mastiff to go. That's up. But this was a great no disqualification match. Just under 11 minutes, and they fit so much into it. And I am very impressed with both men. Next, we had Rhea Ripley versus Tony Storm for the NXT UK Women's Championship. This probably had the best storytelling. I really liked the story being, being told in this match, how Rhea Ripley, the cocky, confident bitch, just beating down and just trash-talking throughout the entire match to the lovable, lovable baby face that's Tony Storm. Tony Storm is... To a certain extent, almost like the female Daniel Bryan of NXT UK. Before Daniel Bryan had this huge heel turn. Tony Storm is so good at what she does. And Tony Storm is probably probably up there in the top five best women's wrestlers in the entire WWE right now. And that's saying something. And, you know, she even cited Becky Lynch as her inspiration. I would love to see Tony Storm versus Becky Lynch. Think about that. Uh, down down the stretch here, we had Rhea Ripley just beating down Tony Storm. Uh, Rhea Ripley hit the Riptide. Storm kicked out. Storm hit Storm Zero. And Ripley kicked out. Now things are starting to get a little good. We went back and forth with a few strikes here and here and there. Rhea Ripley went for the Riptide one more time. Storm countered into a second Storm Zero, and Storm defeated Rhea Ripley. Tony Storm is your new NXT UK Women's Champion. Now, I mentioned before, Triple H tried to get a television deal for NXT UK. Couldn't do it, which is why he started the series really late on the WWE Network. Rhea Ripley has been NXT UK Women's Champion since August. Her reign is realistically, I think it's been 140 days. Her reign was 140 days. She even had a match at Evolution on the pre-show with Dakota Kai for the title that was only seen by the people in attendance. And, you know, the whole tournament was taped back in August and it didn't air until November. So, the fact that Rhea Ripley technically has only been recognized by WWE as having a NXT UK Women's Championship reign of like 44 days, I mean, she kind of got shafted there. Now, I'm not saying that Tony Storm is not worthy of being champion. Most likely, it doesn't matter what happened with Tony Storm's personal issues and the hacks and the leaks. I believe Tony Storm was already slated to win the NXT UK Women's Championship at TakeOver Blackpool, no matter what. But, but, the fact that Triple H couldn't get the television deal, I believe that Triple H was probably thinking about airing the series in possibly September. That way Rhea Ripley's title reign would have extended just a bit, you know, just a bit more. Rhea Ripley was the right choice to win the title, and become the first ever NXT UK Women's Champion. But the fact that Triple H kind of fucked himself over and kind of fucked Rhea Ripley over there with the television deal issue and all that, it kind of shortchanged Rhea Ripley. They were going to give the title to Tony Storm at NXT UK TakeOver no matter what. But I feel as though that they should have just started the series on the WWE Network immediately after those tapings, rather than underestimating it. That was kind of, now nah, it was it was kind of his own fault there. But I'm happy for Tony Storm. I'm happy for Tony Storm. I couldn't be more happier for Tony Storm. And I'd like to see how this plays out. I'd like to see what uh, what she does with it. And I'd like to see who is going to be next in line to face Tony Storm. Now things are starting to get a little more interesting. I'd love to see another match with Tony Storm and Deanna Perrazzo for the NXT UK Women's Championship. After the match that they put on on NXT UK, 
Sounds like a good one. Then we had the main event. This match went 34 minutes. And I can honestly tell you that if it hadn't been for a few botches here and there, a few botches here and there, and the timing was a bit off, this would have been damn near close to a five-star match. Pete Dunne and Joe Coffey. I've been a fan of Joe Coffey since I saw him at the second annual NXT UK Championship Tournament. Joe Coffey, very athletic for his size, very, very, very hard-hitting, and this whole Gallus trio has really been doing him very good. His body of work has been very good in NXT UK. And a lot of people are saying, oh my god, he was gassed in 20 minutes, oh, a few botches here and there. Lord Sullivan botched a Black Mass cell back at TakeOver. No one really batted an eyelash for that, so... Why should why should we bat an eyelash for Joe Coffey? Yeah, it was a yeah, it was a uh, it was a few botches here and there. It was a few few things that were off, but all in all, it's a great fucking main event. That main event's probably going. You look back on that main event with Pete Dunne and Joe Coffey. That main event, I can almost guarantee you. I can almost guarantee you that no matter what WWE picks for the main event of WrestleMania 35, I can guarantee you that that match. That match with Joe Coffey and Pete Dunne is going to be better than the main event of WrestleMania 35. Look at the past three WrestleMania main events that we've had. Pete Dunne and Joe Coffey was better than all of them. That's saying something. This match had everything that you would want in a main event championship match. It had a lot of good drama. Pete Dunne um, doing everything that Pete Dunne does. We had a huge moonsault to the outside. Uh, Joe Coffey, I love Joe Coffey's springboard crossbody, by the way. It's absolutely great. There was a point in this match, midway through the match, Joe Coffey did a sit-out powerbomb to Pete Dunne on the apron. Almost dropped him on his neck. Both men get back into the ring. Uh, the, they go back and forth. Joe Coffey was hit with the bitter end. Joe Coffey kicked out. Joe Coffey hit all his best for the bells that discus lariat and Dunne kicked out. There was a point in the match where Joe Coffey was walking up to the top rope with Pete Dunne having, you know, Pete Dunne was locking Joe Coffey in a triangle. Joe Coffey walked up to the top rope with Pete Dunne, still in the triangle position, and he basically threw Pete Dunne off of the top rope, crashing to the floor. Both men kind of botched the spot up top where they both fell to the floor, but they recovered from that. They were able to recover from that. Uh, Joe Coffey hit all's best for the bells on the outside. Uh, the UK crowd was going crazy. UK was going British wrestling. They were going, uh, UK, UK, are you watching Vince McMahon? It was a point where Joe Coffey did an electric chair German suplex. Beautiful bridge. Pete Dunne hit the bitter end for the third time. Joe Coffey kicked out, but Pete Dunne was able to roll Joe Coffey do the wishbone snap of the fingers, and Joe Coffey tapped out. Great main event, great storytelling, great wrestling, great crowd. And I actually thought that that was it. But out of nowhere comes Walter. I am not too familiar with Walter, but I've heard great things about Walter. And though I have not actually seen Walter wrestle, I am very excited to see what he brings to the table. He walks in, and the crowd's going, Walter, he, they're doing the Goldberg chant, but to Walter's name. Walter ends up big-booting Joe Coffey, and just, I almost hit my, hit my elbow on this thing right here. He puts his hands behind him, and just, just stands very proper. Stands very proper, like, yeah, I'm here. Pete Dunne does his normal shtick, and I believe I can hear him I saw Walter mouth, like he's standing like this and he goes, all right, Peter. He's like, he's like, okay. He's like, you know, we're, we're going to meet down the line. Pete Dunne is not losing that title until he surpasses two years. So at the next NXT UK takeover Blackpool, maybe sometime in the summertime, that is when Walter is going to take the title off of Pete Dunne. Until then, Pete Dunne is going to get a few more successful title defenses here and there. 
probably against Dave Mastiff, probably maybe against someone like Travis Banks, maybe somebody like Eddie Dennis. He's going to get a few more successful title defenses here and there. And then, finally in June, that is when Pete Dunne is going to lose the title to Walter. And Pete Dunne's going to move on to bigger and better things. Pete Dunne, mark my words, Pete Dunne by the end of the year is going to be on the main roster. And he's going to be in a prominent storyline. There's no way you can't. But ladies and gentlemen... That wraps up the rewind for NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool. Um, I was having a tough time getting through this review based on the fact that I was just absolutely speechless. I was absolutely, I was absolutely blown away by how good the show was. It literally had everything that you want out of a professional wrestling pay-per-view. Great storytelling, great wrestling with great characters, surprising moments... Surprising moments. I was never, I would have never guessed that Finn Balor was going to take Travis Banks' place or Walter was going to come out in the end. All, all, all around, I it was damn near a perfect show. Damn near a perfect show. I would say 8.5, 8.5, 8 8.75 out of 10. This close. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, be sure to follow me on Instagram at the DJ Storms. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Storms Takeover. Do not forget to hit that thumbs up. I'm trying to move up in the world. Sorry this review was so late, but I had a lot of other shit to take care of. So hit that thumbs up. I'm trying to get the 10 thumbs up. Keep hitting that thumbs up until you can't hit that thumbs up no more. You're going to give me a thumbs down? There you go. Here's your present. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. I'm trying to get to 200 subs in just two weeks by the Rumble. Trying to do it. Come on, people. Trying to get to 200 subs by the Rumble. If not the Rumble, then the Elimination Chamber. Be sure to leave a comment down below. Tell me what you like the most about NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool. Tell me what you like the most about this review. Be sure. Do not forget. Check out the Stormstream. The 10th annual special edition Stormstream. Lucky number 10. My guest is to be determined. I will let you know who my guest is going to be for the special edition Stormstream this Saturday. Most likely it will be at 7 p.m. Eastern time. I want you guys to set your calendars. If the last storm stream with my man Ethan Craddock from the UK, shout out to him, we did great. It, now that's actually my most liked video and my most liked storm stream to date. It's at 18 likes already. Ethan, you're a draw, my man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm DJ Storms. This has been The Rewind. I hope you have a great week. Hopefully you can enjoy Monday Night Raw, but how can you enjoy Monday Night Raw? Oh, one more thing. Be sure to hit that notifications bell with a huge Walter chop. That way you will know whenever I pop up on YouTube. Because when I pop up on YouTube, it is the best time to be on YouTube. I'm DJ Storms. This has been The Rewind. You enjoy the rest of your day.